thank you all for persevering tonight. I've got two reasons that I came here. And the first is basically I'm here on a dare. You see, this show was held a few months ago and my wife and Brandy came. And they came home afterwards. They saw our friend Kit give a story. And they came back and raved about what a great time it was and what a great event it was and how good all the speakers were. And then they said something that really took me aback. They said, and John, you should go do it. Like, what? No, not me. I'm, I study nuclear physics. I work in a profession not known for storytelling. That's, that's not me, I'm out. But I am curious. So a couple days later, I went to the Tales and Ales website and I was really taken by their motto. And it says, everybody has a story worth sharing. Here's your chance. So on that, I'm here tonight. So I need to tell you a little bit about what I do and, and my job requires a lot of travel. I fly a lot domestically, I fly a lot internationally and I need to confide in you uh, that I really hate traveling, I loathe it. <laughs> and after a few years, my boss caught on to this that I wasn't traveling up to his expectations. And he would say, you need to get out on the road, you gotta go see our customers, you gotta go see our suppliers, you're not traveling enough. And I eventually confided in him that uh, I have a mild to severe fear of flying. Okay, in one ear, out the other. A couple months later, we're on a tr mandatory trip together and we're coming back on the last leg of this flight, coming into Reagan National and we get the announcement from the captain that no nervous passenger wants to hear. And it's, ladies and gentlemen, I regret to inform you, we're gonna be making an emergency landing this evening. The uh, landing gear of the aircraft has failed to lock in position, uh, but we think everything's gonna be okay. <laughs> I, I always sit in a window seat and I can look as we're circling lap after lap as the fire trucks and ambulances and emergency equipment gather and line the runway. And eventually we make our descent and I pull out my Blackberry, this was a few years ago, and I text my boss and I say, did I ever tell you that I hate flying, all upper caps, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. We land semi-uneventfully, we run through the end of the runway, into the grass, stopping just before we hit the Potomac, <laughs> right? But that wasn't the worst thing that happened to me on a plane. You see, I already was afraid of flying. And that's because of things that happened to me when I was a boy. And for that, I need to tell you a little bit about my father. <laughs> see, my dad was a World War II veteran. And he served in the Pacific on an aircraft carrier. And because of that experience, he came back with a passion for flying. He loved to fly. And his dream was to have his own airplane. And he worked really hard and saved his money. And eventually he bought his own plane, but it wasn't like a nice jet or a turboprop. It was a little bitty plane with a cute little propeller and it barely held four people inside. I would describe it more of a Ford Pinto with wings, right? <laughs> And he loved to fly and he spent all of his spare time flying, but he had some mishaps. Like one mishap was he's flying into North Carolina and the electrical system cuts out on his plane and he has to make an emergency landing. He lands on a highway near Chapel Hill and you get a, a ticket from the highway patrol for that. <laughs> you also get written up in our small town newspaper much to the chagrin of my sisters and my mother, they take the wings off the plane and they tow you home. Uh, another mishap is he's flying my big brother Willis back from the mountains and with his bride. And dad remarks that, boy, they've made really good time on this flight. They're back earlier than he would have thought. And this is in the 1970s before as much electronic information and he, drops Willis off at the, air, at the small little regional airport, and dad immediately turns the plane around, takes off and flies, and my brother walks to the back of the terminal to find the little car that he's parked, and it's not there, but
because my father's dropped him off at the wrong airport <laughs> in the wrong town at 11 o'clock at night. So, the last mishap that I think of is with me as a young, I was the baby, so I was basically his mascot or sidekick and got taken with him whenever he couldn't get anybody else to fly with him. So one Saturday morning, you know, he didn't put his plane in a hangar. He tied it up to the edge of the airplane, at the edge of the airport, because it's less expensive. And you tie it down so it doesn't blow away. And you tie down each of the wings and the nose cone. My dad was always in a hurry. And he's rushing, and he unties one wing, and he unties the nose cone. And maybe it was my job, I don't know, I was eight, to untie the other wing. <laughs> It didn't get untied. We jump in the plane, he starts it up, he hits the throttle, the plane goes forward until the wing catches with the rope and it spins in a circle and we hit a pipe and it ripped the wing off and that, that ended our flight for that day. But all that's kind of prelude to why I wanted to tell you my real story was each summer we would make a family trip, a pilgrimage to go see my big sister Vicky in Dallas, Texas. And we did this for several summers in a row, and we'd stop halfway through and refuel the plane. And then one summer, my dad decides that he can make this trip nonstop. And if you look on Google Maps from Danville, Virginia, my hometown, to Dallas, Texas, is 1,158 miles. Doing my research for this tonight, I looked, the cruising distance of my dad's plane was only 950 miles but he had a plan to utilize every drop of gasoline in that plane. And that plane had three different gas tanks, one in one wing, one in the other wing, and one in the fuselage. And he didn't tell this plan to me, but in the approximately six hour flight, we're flying for an hour, and then a second hour comes, and he runs the plane out of gas in one tank. The engine cuts off, it's silent. The plane starts to drop from the sky, and I'm a little kid, so I start to scream. <laughs> My big sister Valerie, being a quick thinker, grabs a pillow and smothers me <laughs> in the back of the plane so we don't disturb our father, who calmly reaches over and switches the lever from the left tank to the right tank and restarts the plane, and we start to raise in altitude and fly again. My father's totally unbothered, but I'm traumatized, right? A couple hours go by, this happens again. Engine cuts off, silence, plane drops, John screams, sister smothers me, father turns over to the third gas tank, restarts the plane, and we land in Dallas, Texas with gallons of gas to spare. My dad was very proud of himself, but I would probably never be the same. So a year goes by and we're making the trip the next summer and I start to nag my dad. I'm like, dad, could we stop somewhere along the way and refuel the plane? He's like, son, I've already proven we can make it nonstop. Please stop nagging me. That morning we go to the airport and I nag him one more time, can we please stop? And he says, son, don't worry. I found a way to make this trip more comfortable. And he opens up this box and he pulls out this contraption and it has a funnel and a little valve, hand operated valve and a receptacle. And he calls it his range extender but it's really just a small portable urinal to make the trip more comfortable for him, but not for the rest of us. So we're flying, hour one goes by, hour and a half. I'm waiting for the plane to cut off as we get near the two hour mark. I'm trying to nod in and out of consciousness. And then I hear my father start to curse and mumble. And then the plane goes into a big nosedive and we make an unscheduled landing in Rome, Georgia, and dad reaches back into his suitcase and gets some clean clothes out, and as he gets out of the cockpit, 
we see from his waist to his knees, he is soaking wet. <laughs> he had urinated all over himself because he had failed to properly operate the valve <laughs> on his range extender. So he goes into the terminal, changes clothes, he comes back, we can see him walking, he's got a scowl on his face. He opens up the plane, uh, the cockpit, and I start to giggle. And then my sister starts to giggle, and my mom starts to laugh, and my dad's frown turns into a laugh. And I said, hey dad, I don't wanna piss you off. Can, can we get some more gas? So we refuel the plane, we make it to Dallas, uneventfully, and looking back, that was the last time we made that family trip. You know, time goes on, children grow up, your parents get older, which brings me to the second reason I wanted to come here tonight. And that is, I mentioned that my dad was a World War II veteran and that he loved to fly. He also practiced medicine in our small town for almost 60 years, taking care of the poorest, sickest people in need. And for vacations, he would go to exotic locations and take care of people like Vietnam and Afghanistan and Haiti. So the second reason I'm here is really to tell a story about my father and about myself. So thank you for tonight.